to have honest, real, raw, true conversation and prayer with God. You go down into the water, and when you do, the old person dies. You come up out of the water as a new creation of Jesus Christ. Hey, welcome to Church Experience. Thank you so much for spending part of your weekend with us. Now is a great time to grab your weeklies and head to your seats if you haven't already because the service starts in 90 seconds. I'm here to tell you today that God wants to set you free. Oh yeah. He wants to set you free. relationship with him. Grow in your walk with him. Get closer to him. Spend more time with him because he's better. If you want your life to get better, then get around the one who is better. Get around Jesus. Get around the one who has power to change and transform your life. Get around the one who has the perfect grace for you and the perfect love for you and the perfect joy for your soul. Listen, he is better.
Hey, what's up Church Experience Online? We're so glad that you're here with us today. We have a great service ahead. And look, I don't know what kind of week you've had behind you or what you're looking forward to in the week ahead, but here's what I can tell you. Right here at the end of one week and the beginning of another, as you put Jesus first through your worship, as we get into his word, I'm telling you, he's gonna work in your life like never before. And so we're so excited about, it. that's what we're praying for, that's what we're hoping for in your life, that God does a fresh new work in your spirit. And so we're looking forward to seeing what he does as we get into worship here in a few moments. But first of all, we just wanna start out and just say, hey, thank you for connecting with us through this online service. But if you wanna take a next step, if you wanna go deeper, maybe you have a question, maybe you wanna get connected with somebody, maybe get involved in a group, maybe you wanna attend an in-person service, uh, you can go to our website, uh, backslash connect, or you can scan this QR code and I'll pop up a form that you can fill out and we'll reach out to you personally and ask you how we can help. So please do that if you'd like to get connected. We always love hearing your input. We'd love to hear back from you. But with that being said, we're about to get into worship. And one thing I wanna say before we worship is I understand that you might have some big things on your mind right now. Maybe it's a big decision. Maybe it's a big problem. Maybe it's a massive need. And no matter how big the mountain ahead of you is, no matter how big it seems, I just wanna remind you that God is bigger. So as we worship him today, keep your eyes on God, not on your problems. And I guarantee you, as you worship God and as you put him first, you will see not your problems go away, now not instantly, but you will see them put in the right perspective. You'll see how big God is in comparison to what seemed like a really big problem. You see that God is even bigger. So let's put him first. Let's worship today with all of our heart. Put all the distractions away. Let's get after it. Here we go. There's a table that you've prepared for me in the presence It's your body and your blood you've shed for me. This is how I find my battle. There's a table that you've prepared for me. In the presence of my enemy. It's your body. Jesus, oh Jesus, I 
when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And I look at the space between where it used to be and this reckoning I know I'll never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me, there was another in the waters holding back the sea. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there was a cross that bears no burden. Where another died for me, there was another in the fire. slave to my sin anymore I should have fallen in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning either way I won't fall to the things I've this I know I'll never be alone there is 
Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you that your word says you will never forsake us, that you are always with us, that you are there in the fire, you are there in the pits. In our darkest days, in our darkest hours, Lord, you are with us. There's not anywhere that we can go that you are not there with us, Lord. And we just thank you for that. Lord, I just pray that you would strengthen our faith in your word today. Father God, speak to our hearts. Pierce our heart with your word, Lord. God, we just thank you. And all our praise and worship belongs to you, Lord. We just worship you. We give you all the glory and honor, Lord. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.
Can we please have quiet on the set? This morning we're finishing up our series called Cast of Characters, and in this series we have been taking a look at some of the characters that are described in the Bible. We're looking at their, their list of qualities and attributes and seeing what made them stand out from other people and seeing if we might be able to incorporate some of those qualities and attributes in our lives so that we can stand out as well. We have talked about people like Abraham, who had great faith. When God says, hey, I want you to move, he said, okay, where? And God says, I don't know yet, just move. He was willing to get up and go. When he waited for, for all this time to, to have a child, and God says, go sacrifice the child, he had the faith that to go and to, to begin to do that. We talked about Jonathan and how Jonathan had such great love and friendship for David and that we need to have that kind of love and friendship for each other. And when we do, we develop the kind of relationships that God can use to do great things together. Then we talked about Solomon and his wisdom. And we learned from Solomon that although uh, chasing after uh, things like wealth and fame and fortune and wisdom, all of those things are good in their own way, yet chasing after those apart from God uh, is all just vanity and it's worthless. And then last week we talked about Jonah. That was a character we said, don't be like Jonah. If you remember, when God said go this way, he went that way. And God eventually had to reel him back in through a series of unfortunate events until he was able to do what God called him to do. Now this morning, I want you to consider this. Consider all of the things that are happening around us today in our society. Does it feel to you like we're living in the end times? This, this isn't a, a message on end times or anything like that, but it, it just feels to me sometimes when you see everything that's happening and, and becoming acceptable today, like the world's going to hell in a handbasket and, and the way things are going today. I mean, it seems to me like a majority of the people have accepted the lowering of the bar of morality to the point where it seems impossible that we'll ever be able to, to bring it back up where it is supposed to be according to God's Word. Things that were considered socially unacceptable for centuries have now become normal. Not only are they accepted now, but they're shoved down our throats, and if we don't get in line with them and go along with them, and then we're going to be shunned, or we're going to be made fun of, or we're going to be canceled, or we're going to be ostracized. You see, what the Bible describes as wickedness and the Bible describes as evil has become normal today. Has there ever been a time on earth when things got this bad? Well, yes, there has been. There was a time that, that things got so bad that evil became so prevalent that God even regretted ever making man to begin with. And today's character had to live through that time. Today we're going to take a look at the life of Noah. And listen to this passage in Genesis chapter 6 about how bad the people of the world had become. It said, The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. That's pretty bad, isn't it? The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race that I have created, 
and with them all the animals and the birds and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have ever made them. Then in verse 11 through 13, he goes on to say, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and it was full of violence. Does that sound familiar? God saw, saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all of the people on earth had corrupted their ways. Who corrupted their ways? All of the people on the earth had corrupted their ways. So God says to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people. For the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. And Noah's saying, wait, what? What did you say you're going to do? I don't think I heard you right because I'm, I'm doing my best to walk your path, God, and, and to walk the way that you say I should go, and, and you're going to destroy all the people? That can't be right. Have you ever felt like Noah? Felt like you feel like you're you're doing your best to walk the path, but everyone else is walking the other direction? Well, you should feel that way. If not, shame on you. It's so easy to have the mindset today that says, you know what? This is what everyone else is doing. The majority of the people in the world think that this is okay. And I know that the Bible tells me differently. But, but that was written thousands of years ago. Things have changed. Times have changed. We're more tolerant now. We're more accepting now. And when we think that way, who are we putting on the God seat? Well, we're either putting other people on the God seat who come up with these ideas, or we're putting ourselves on the God seat. And we don't get to decide what's acceptable and, and, and not acceptable. That's God's job. He's the only one who gets to sit on the God seat. And he decided long ago what is right and what is wrong, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Ours is not to question his choices. Ours is not to try to change his choices to measure up to what the world deems to be acceptable. And I, I know we often think, well, you know what, the whole world is doing it. It can't be wrong if, if everyone thinks that this is the right way to live. I can't fight the whole world. Why don't we just accept change and go along with it? What's the harm in that? Well, Solomon, who we discovered a few weeks ago, was the wisest man that ever lived in the world, explains very clearly what the harm in that is in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. He says, there is a way that appears to be right. But in the end, it leads to destruction. It seems right. Everyone is doing it. Everyone has accepted it. It's, it's nice and it's tolerant. It seems like the right thing to do. But in the end, it leads to destruction. So here's the first point today. When you ask yourself, is it possible to, to live right? Is it possible to be righteous in a world that is become corrupt and full of evil? Here's the first point. It is possible to do good when all the world around us is evil. It is possible to do good when all the world around us is evil. How can we walk in this path that Scripture sets out for us to walk in when everyone else in the world is walking the other direction? Is it even possible to do that? Well, Noah is a great example for us that it is possible. Here's what it says in Genesis chapter 6, verses 8 and 9. In the midst of God just saying that the world has become corrupt, it's full of evil, I'm going to wipe everybody out, he says this, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, even when all the world was evil. Noah was blameless among the people of his time and he walked faithfully with God. Then in chapter 7, verse 1, it says, So the Lord says to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. It is possible to be good in an evil world. 
You know, I love the t-shirts that have the pictures on them. You've probably seen the t-shirt before. It's got all of the fish swimming in one direction, and right in the middle there's a Christian fish sign swimming in the other direction. Kind of the idea that, that I get when I, I think of this story of Noah. Because that's what we are called to do. And I think you're going to find that when you're willing to do that, pretty soon some of the other fish are going to turn around and follow you in the direction that you're going. You ever go to the grocery store and maybe there's three lanes and two of the lanes have lines that are very long and the, there's no one in the third lane. And what do you think? Hmm, there must be a reason that, that there's no one in that lane over there. I mean, if it was open, surely somebody would be in that lane, but there's a person next to the cash register. So should I give it a try or should I not? So finally, you go against the flow and you go into that lane and you start putting your things up on the belt and the person says, may I help you? And you go, wow, the, the lane was open. And when other people see that they're sending you through that lane, what do they do? They all come over to your lane, right? And that's kind of a, a story of what happens to us when we decide that we're not going to go with the flow of the world, which God's word said is, is evil and corrupt, and we're going to go a different direction. When we do that, we're going to find other people who go, hey, it is possible to be good in a world that's filled with evil, and they'll begin to follow you as well. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy. You will be tested, you will be teased, you will be tortured, but do you want your end to lead to death, or do you want your end to lead to life? So that's the first point. It is possible to be good when the world around us is evil, and Noah is a great example of that. He was found righteous in the eyes of God when the rest of the world was so corrupt, God was sorry that he ever made them. Now here's the second point. Sometimes God's directions for you, are not going to make any sense at all. Follow them anyway. Say follow them anyway with me. Follow them anyway. That's, that's the answer. When you, when you have a, a child do this, why? Because I said so. Do it anyway. And that's kind of the idea here. Has God ever called you to do something that didn't make sense to you? Why would he want me to do that? It doesn't make any sense. Think of all of the people in the Bible that were asked to do something that didn't make any sense to them, but they followed God's directions anyway. Think of Abraham. We already mentioned him today. God said, I want you to move. And he goes, okay. And he packed up. He says, where are we going? God says, I'm not going to tell you yet. Just, just start going. It doesn't make any sense. But he did it. Later, he waited over 100 years to have a child. He finally has a child. God says, bring him up on the mountain and sacrifice him. Doesn't make any sense why I would wait this long to have a child and sacrifice him, but God, if you said do it, I'm going to do it anyway. And he went up and he set out to do that. We think of people like David, who God says, I want you to go and take down this huge giant that everyone else is afraid of, and, and you'll do it with just a few smooth stones in a sling. Well, that doesn't make sense to me, but I'll do it anyway. Think of Jehoshaphat. He was leading God's army. God's plan was this for Jehoshaphat. Just put the choir in the front of the army, and, and they will defeat everybody. Does that make sense to, in war, to put the choir in front? That's what he did. Think of Naaman. Naaman had leprosy. God says, all right, you just go down and, and dip in the Jordan River seven times. That didn't make any sense to Naaman. There were, were better rivers than that where he was from, but he did it anyway. Think of, of the lame man that that was, was not able to walk his whole life. And God, through Peter and, and John, told him, hey, pick up your bed and walk. That doesn't make any sense. If I could do that, I would have done it years ago. But he did it anyway. What is the result of all of these people getting instructions that don't make any sense to them and following them anyway? They were always blessed. Noah was instructed to do something that didn't make any sense to him. What would you have done? People were, were making fun of him for following God's instructions. It seemed like a useless endeavor to him. Here is what God asked Noah to do in, in chapter 6, starting in verse 14. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Noah 
had no idea of, of boatmanship. He wasn't a carpenter. He, he wasn't an engineer or a craftsman. He, he worked in the field is what Noah did. And God wants me to make this a large boat? He says, I, I think I know what cypress wood is. He said, make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long. Well, a cubit is back then was measured from your elbow to the tip of, of your middle finger. So he said it was usually averaged about 18 inches or a foot and a half. So it's 300 cubits long. That's well over an entire football field in length, just to think how long this boat was. Make it 50 cubits wide, 30 cubits high. Since then, engineers have taken those numbers and they said if a, a craft was created at that particular size, it would be impossible for it to flip over in rough seas. Then make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all around. Put a door in the side of the ark, make a lower, middle, and upper decks, and then I'm going to bring down floodwaters on the earth to destroy all of life under heaven. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. Now, keep in mind that where Noah is, there is no water. There's no seas around there. There's no lakes. There's no rivers. He's in the middle of just dry land, and God wants him to build this, this giant boat that they said was so big it wasn't until the mid-1900s that a, another boat was built anywhere near that size. Then continuing in verse 19, you're to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you and will be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. That's just crazy. Why would anyone do that? It doesn't make any sense at all. So how does Noah respond to that? Well, in Genesis 6.22, it says this, Noah did everything just as God commanded him. We need to follow Noah's example. When God puts something on our hearts that we're to do for him, and it doesn't make any sense, we're to do everything just as God commands us. We need to follow his example. However, if we do that, sometimes we wonder, why is it taking so long? And this is the next point for you. God's timing may seem like it takes forever, but wait. Say that with me. Wait. Wait. <laughs> you know, we, we follow him anyway, and we wait. You know, sometimes we feel like God is, is putting something in our heart to do, and, and we get all excited about it and we get jazzed up about it, and we're ready to go right now. Let's do it. And nothing happens. We wait, and we wait, and we, we seem like, like it's just taking forever. And, and when that happens, the excitement begins to wear off, and now you're questioning if maybe you made a mistake about what God wanted you to do in the first place. So what do you do? You end up just giving up. Do you, do you move on to take a, a, on another task? Well, well, here's what Noah did. In Genesis 7, 4, it says, Seven days from now I will send rain on the earth, and for 40 days and for 40 nights I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. So he's going to be on the boat for seven days before it starts raining. And that, to me, would have been too much. Have you ever gone on a cruise, and before you leave, they make you all go on the deck and, and get the life preservers on to tell you, you know, if something happens, this is where the life preservers are. Here's where the boats are you get on. And, and you just want to go on the cruise, don't you? And, and here, Noah and his family and all the animals are on the boat seven days before they even, le even leave. And then after seven days, it rains 40 days and 40 nights. Takes forever. 40 days and 40 nights. Could you do that? I flew twice from here to the Ukraine. It was an 11-hour flight uh, from New York to the Ukraine, and uh, that was too long. 
I am too long for short uh, seats in airplanes for 11 hours. So once we would take off and I'd look around, I would walk into first class and sit in one of those chairs and, and, and fly the rest of the way that way. But 11 hours is too long. You know, you think anything uh, good you could do for a long time, but think of getting a massage. You know, a half an hour massage feels good, doesn't it? Some of you even get a, a whole hour massage, and oh, that's, that's wonderful. But an 11-hour massage? You know, please stop. You're, you're tearing my skin off. Don't touch me anymore, you think, right? This ark was, was filled with smelly animals floating on water, not just for the 40 days and the 40 nights, but for a total of 377 days. Do you think that would have felt like forever? In Genesis 7, 23, every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and the animals and the creatures that move along the ground and the birds were, were all wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him on the ark. And the waters flooded the earth for 150 days. Now, there's a chart. I don't know if they were able to, to get it up here or not that, that shows uh, how long they were, were in the boat. And you can't see it very well there. But um, they do have it available on our church website, uh, on the Facebook page for our church. So if you want to see this in, in detail, you can go there. But, but it shows that there were 377 days that they were on that boat. And that seems like a long time, doesn't it? It's, it's over a year. How many of you would have persevered through that time? How many of you would have kept waiting, believing that you were doing the right thing, that you made the right choice? See, we tend to give up so easy today. We, we want everything done right now. We live in this microwave society that if you can't have it this minute, then it's too long to wait. I remember I used to, to go out to lunch with Preacher Bob when I was young and was here. And, and Preacher Bob would always say, you know, if I go anywhere and there's a line of any kind, I'm not going to go there. And I'm thinking if there's not a line, then the food must not be very good. I don't want to go there. You know, it's, it's a whole different perspective. But God gave Noah directions of the things he was supposed to do. Noah did exactly what the Lord asked him to do and what was the result of waiting when it seemed like it was taking forever. And that's the last point for you. We are blessed when we follow God's directions and we wait on his time. Just like Abraham was blessed when, when God told him, don't sacrifice Isaac, here's a ram to take his place. Just like Naaman was blessed when his leprosy was washed away in the Jordan River. Just like Jehoshaphat and his army was blessed when the choir went first and the other, other army was baffled by this and they, they ran away. Just like David was blessed when he threw one smooth stone and felled the giant. And just like the lame man was blessed that never walked before, that was able to rise up and walk all for following God's instructions, even when those instructions didn't make any sense and they had to wait on God to act, Noah was also blessed. Here's what Scripture says the results of his waiting and following instructions were in chapter 9. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall on the beast of the earth and all the birds of the sky, on every creature that moves along the ground and on all the fish in the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. See, that's a great blessing. Noah and his sons are going to be blessed. They're going to be allowed to increase in number and fill the earth. We are all now descendants of Noah and his family. The animals and the birds, uh, they're all given into their hands. They're all going to follow their lead and, and be subject to them. And here's something for all you vegetarians and vegans out there. Everything that lives and moves about on the earth, God says, is going to be food for you. I like that, don't you? What a blessing. In verse 8 in chapter 9, it says, God says to Noah and to his sons with him, I'm now going to establish my covenant with you and wish 
with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on the earth, I'm going to establish this covenant with you. What's the covenant? Never again will all of life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. See, another blessing is that God establishes this covenant with Noah and with everyone after Noah, that, that, that he is never going to destroy the world again with a flood. So, so much for all this global warming talk that the ice caps are going to melt and, and water's going to go over all the land and everyone's going to die. God says, no, I'm not going to let that happen. And in 12 through 16, God said, this is the sign of the covenant I'm making between me and you. I'm going to give you a sign to help you remember that I made this covenant. I've set my rainbow in the clouds. It will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. See, the, the rainbow was going to be a sign to us that it is possible for one person doing good to overcome all of the evil that surrounds them. And it's going to be a sign to them that, that God promises in this everlasting covenant that he is never going to destroy the world with a flood again every time we see that rainbow. And verse 28 tells us the last blessing that Noah received. After the flood... Noah lived 350 more years. Well, Noah was 600 when God told him to build the ark. So it says Noah lived a total of 950 years, and then he died. I'd say that's a pretty great blessing, wouldn't you? After everyone else in the world perished because they're evil, Noah, who was righteous in the eyes of God, lives for another 350 years after the flood, dying at 950 years old. You see, Noah is proof to us today that when it seems that, that all of the world around us is swimming in the wrong direction, if it's a direction that's opposite the direction God wants us to swim, that it's possible to swim against the flow, to follow God's path for our life, and even though it may not make sense to us, even though it may seem like it takes forever, you're going to find out that if you persevere and you do what he asks and you wait patiently, that like Noah, you will be blessed. And you will live a, a much longer time with God than a mere 950 years. You'll be able to live with him for an eternity. Would you pray with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you loved us so much that you want to save us. And Father, although it seems like everything around us is going away from you, Father, help us to have the heart and the mind and the soul that wants to follow you anyway. Help us to be willing to go against the flow, to do what you ask us to do, even when it doesn't make sense to us. Help us to be willing to wait for your timing. And Father, when we do those things, we look forward to the blessings that you promise. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Before our usher team comes forward to receive our tithes and offerings and response cards, here's a few important things happening with our CE family. Actively serving not only brings us closer to God, but helps us fulfill our purpose by making a real difference in others' lives. Through serving at Church Experience, you'll use the unique ways that God has gifted you to help create welcoming environments where He can change lives. To learn more about the various ways you can serve at CE, check the Serving Teams bubble on the back of your response card. As our ushers come forward to collect our response cards and receive our tithes and offerings, 
We started our next initiative last November with a vision to collectively make a bigger kingdom investment that stretches into future generations. Since launching Next, we have helped people in financial crisis and also people in need of Christian counseling while going out into our communities with eight Serve Our City events. Over the next six months, we plan to open three new CE campuses in Florida, Cape Coral, West Chase, and Ellington. We've raised our investment in the next generation as we've made massive improvements to student experience at our Central and Dunedin campuses with hopes of launching student experience at other campuses in the near future. We've also invested in inspiring building improvements in Dunedin and Butler. We're so excited to celebrate all that we've seen God do through Next over the past few months. But we believe there is so much more to come and more people to reach for Christ. If you are not currently giving to Next, please prayerfully consider joining us. When you give above and beyond your regular tithing to the Next Fund, you are fueling the vision of our church family forward. You can give online by selecting Next Fund at churchexperience.tv slash give or write Next in the memo line of your check. To each person who has given above and beyond to the next fund, thank you for your generosity. Thank you for being on mission with us to help more people experience a full life in Jesus Christ.
Hey, thanks so much for joining us today. I hope you're leaving encouraged. I hope your spirit's refreshed and God's working in your life in a new way. And man, it's gonna be a great week ahead. I'm, I'm hoping that for you. I'm believing that for you. And so whatever you have in front of you, just remember what you learned today. Remember what God did and take that with you throughout the week. Because look, God doesn't stay here in this service. He's going with you everywhere you go. So let's get after it. Let's go into this week ahead. And, and, and by the way, if, if you have any questions from today's service, if you have any comments or prayer requests, if there's anything we can do to help you, uh, I wanna encourage you to go to our website, fill out that, that form. You can even scan the QR code right here and, and just let us know how we can help, how we can serve you. We would love to be more of a part of your life. Love to help you get connected. And by the way, if you wanna go to our website or our social media, there's other opportunities where you can learn more about church experience. You can learn how to be involved. But man, either way, we're just so happy that we get to be a part of your life. And I hope that this week, God is a part of everything that you do. Thanks again for joining us. See you next weekend.